Thank you all for watching. It's been a great series and they are going to continue. Also, we're going to continue our very popular giveaway. We've been giving away memberships in the Lake Superior Railroad Museum one a day last week, and we've extended that one a day this week as well, which means five more memberships for a total of 10 that'll be given away. Now, what do you get for your membership? Well, of course, you can come to the Lake Superior Railroad Museum in Duluth at the depot anytime you want. And, of course, you can take train rides on the North Shore Scenic Railroad. You'll find out first about special member-only events, and we've got a lot of those scheduled throughout the year once we get back to normal. You also get four issues of our very popular Junction Magazine. It's a full-color, 40-plus page report. It tells you about what's going on in the museum. It has interesting historical articles about all forms of railroading. We take you in every part of the museum's operation. And also, a very unique portion of our magazine is Today's News is Tomorrow's History. There's a whole section on the back about goings-on in the railroad industry today in our area. So it's a complete magazine, comes out four times a year, and it's one of the definite advantages to being a member of the museum. So all you have to do is go to the comment section on this video, put I want to win, leave us a note, and randomly we'll select a winner each and every day this week. This is part number one of a two-part series. We've told you about hand-powered motive of operation of railroad equipment. We've told you about our steam engines in the collection. We've told you about our diesel electric engines. Also, we have electric engines. These two here are the two motors that are electric powered. No diesel, no steam, just electricity. We have two of them, so we thought we'd do a two-part series. Part one tomorrow on the HANA, and part one today on the Milwaukee Box Cab. The Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul and Pacific Railway, the Milwaukee Road, began building in 1847. Most of its early life, it was just a Midwest Granger, but the guys in the front office decided, you know what, we should go to the West Coast like all the other big railroads are doing. And while it was a good decision, it was way too late. They started building their Pacific Extension in 1906, finished it three years later in 1909, but because they were the last one to make the route, they got the worst route. They had to go through the Bitterroot and the Cascade Mountains, the only route that was left available to them, and it was the one all the other railroads had discarded. Too many peaks and valleys, too steep a grade, and it was cold, 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 cold. That made working a steam locomotive very inefficient. Putting two steamers together to pull long haul freights over those mountain drags, very impossible. So they took a new route. They went electric. Working with General Electric, they electrified the entire 660 mile of the stretch that they were going to go over the biggest and steepest mountains. Up above, the wire, called a cantonary, carrying 3,000 volts of DC power. To get the power into the motor to make the engine go and pull the train was a pentagram. And that reached up, touched the wire, and transmitted the electricity down into the box cab, as these were called. We're going to take you inside and show you all it worked, but we'll have more on this in tomorrow's episode and the HANA mining engine. It's a little easier to understand there, but wait till you see what's inside this big beauty. One of the neat things about the Lake Spear Railroad Museum and our display of the 10200 electric from the Milwaukee Road Railroad, by the way, the very first one ever built, is that you get to climb up and go inside. You get to see what it was like to be the engineer, the fireman. You also get to see how this whole thing worked. This was a revolutionary technology at the time, electrifying a railroad. So much so that when these engines were delivered in 1915 by General Electric to the Milwaukee Road, they took it on a tour so that everyone could see. Here's a picture of the engine in Butte, Montana. And as you can see, the people blocked to see it. Let's go inside now, and I'll show you a little bit more about this exciting piece of new technology. Keep in mind, in a diesel electric locomotive, you have the diesel engine running a generator, makes electricity to make the motors work. Here, you don't need the diesel. You're getting the electricity off the canton area above, and all you need to do is convert it through the rectifiers and send it straight to the electric motors. That's a lot of efficiency in that. Here we have one of the big generator sets. This is powering the huge blowers that keep the engines from overheating the motors on the wheels themselves. Let's take a look in the cab. Here in the cab, you see where the engineer would sit. They would have the controls for the engine right here. They'd look out the window to see the track ahead of them. Here are the brakes for the uh, engine, also for the train, one set for each. Here's the throttle, 
And of course, you have the electronic controls to let you know that you have enough electricity toward the job ahead. One of the neat things about this was that they had regenerative electricity. So as you're going up the hill, you need all that electricity coming off the wire and powering the motors and making the engine move. When you're going down the hill, you don't need that electricity. Instead, you turn the electric motors into generators and you turn that kinetic energy back into the wire as potential energy for the next train coming up the hill behind you. This 10200 box cab was the very first one ever delivered by General Electric to the Milwaukee Road, and that was in 1915. It continued working until 1974. That's when they discontinued the use of electric because, well, by that time, diesel engines had become more powerful and could pull the trains over the high elevations and steep grades on the Milwaukee Road through its mountain Pacific region. The problem was in 1977, a couple of years after they stopped using this, the Milwaukee Road was in deep financial doo-doo. They were going to file for bankruptcy and they had assets to sell. One of the assets was this electric cab, which the president of the railway had determined was going to be saved for posterity in some museum. Our friend Nick Callis, who was the curator at the time of the Illinois Railway Museum and its general manager, probably one of the most prolific collectors of railroad history and artifacts ever to walk through a museum. Nick thought he had this one in the bag. He was convinced that the 10200 was going to come to the Illinois Railway Museum. In fact, they'd even put money down on the deal. And then, we're not saying exactly how this happened, but it did, and the engine mysteriously arrives in Duluth in 1977 to join the collection of the Lake Superior Railroad Museum, much to my good friend Nick Callis's consternation. And there you have a tour of the very first ever box cab, built in 1915 for the Milwaukee Road Railroad. As you can see, it's open to the public uh, once we're reopened to the public. In the meantime, of course, don't forget tomorrow we'll be back with the tour of the Hanna Mining Company steeple cab electric motor. In the meantime, when we're open, you can come back and see all this and the rest of our collection, and we hope that's sooner than later. In the meantime, though, you know what to do. Wash your hands, cover your coughs, don't touch your face, keep that social distance. If you're sick, stay home, and whatever you do, let's take care of each other.